Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement, I welcome you all to the International Young Scholars Summit 2020. I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished chair for the session, Dr. Monish Tarangbim, fellow scholars and participants who have joined us through Zoom and are watching us live on Facebook. We are glad to witness your presence today. This international forum aims to bring together rigorous and erudite young scholars from all around the world over a single platform. The aim is to create an academic space to encourage young scholars and academicians from the field of international relations, political science, diplomacy, public policy, administration, and related subfields. The conference will be held for three days consecutively and will have 30 different sessions with two sessions running parallelly throughout in the white and green rooms. The conference will feature 275 scholars from 25 different countries who will be delivering their presentations and sharing their understanding on various topics with us. This session is being streamed on our Facebook. So please feel free to share it on your social media handle with the hashtag IYSS2020. This is the 10th session of the conference and to chair and moderate this session, it's a real pleasure to have with us Dr. Monish Tarangwin with between us. Dr. Manish is a visiting fellow at NICE. He's a senior assistant professor at the Department of Geopolitics and International Relations, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, MAHG, Manipal, India, and the coordinator of the Northeast Studies Center at MAHG. Formerly, he was an associate fellow at the Observer Research Foundation, New Delhi, and a visiting, and a visiting faculty at Ansar University, Haryana. He has a number of publications to his credit and has, a, has, has been a regular contributor to a number of prominent strategic affairs platforms, including the South Asian Voices and the Diplomat. He holds an MPhil and a PhD from the JNU University, New Delhi, India. Sir, we welcome you. Please take the session forward. Thank you. Thank you, Paki, as always, and uh, thank you for the generous introduction. And I uh, welcome all the speakers to the forum. And uh, without wasting any more time, because we have nine speakers to cover <coughs> in a uh, limited time, and we have to stick to time, um, we are here to deliberate, uh, you know, on a range of issues. As anyone who can see the nine speakers can tell, it stretches from what we call as South Asia up to Southeast Asia. So it's sort of interesting that the uh, session has been named as neighborhood. So, you know, as we go ar uh, around the speakers, uh, we will deliberate more on uh, whose, neighbor whose neighborhood is it anyway, you know, uh, from where we sit and stand and how we look at what is our neighborhood and what is the extended form of that neighborhood. Uh, 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 one uh, special housekeeping rule as a chair, uh, I will put on my military watch uh, as soon as the speaking session starts. And, uh, uh, you know, I apologize uh, to all the speakers that I will intervene at the six minute with a show of hand like this. And that means that it is time for you to make your concluding remarks so that we give time to everyone. And we still have some time wherein uh, we can raise some questions. So uh, without any further ado, uh, let's start uh, with the first presentation, which is going to be made by Lopzang Dorji, who is a lecturer at the Royal University of Bhutan. And he is going to talk about a very interesting theme. And the interest of the theme lies in the title, which, which he calls uh, Bhutan is a land link country, uh, a case study. Uh, so it is over to you, Lopzang. Uh, you have eight, uh, eight minutes strictly, and your time starts now. Am I audible? Da? Yes, please go ahead. Am I audible? Yes, Lord uh, uh, Respected ahead. chair, uh, yeah. respected chair, dignified, diverse participants across the world. I'm here to talk on the topic, a study on Bhutan as land link country for a few minutes. Before I present you the length and breadth of my study, let me thank Professor Pramod and Nice for organizing the Young Scholar International Summit via webinar in the wake of pandemic COVID-19. And apology to the organizer that I miss formal session as I'm patrolling the crowd in the town to manage COVID-19 protocol. To begin my presentation, title of my paper will suffice the rationale of my study. And uh, many of you are aware about Kingdom of Bhutan. The Norman creature referring Bhutan to outside world as landlocked country in Himalaya situated between China in the north and India in the south. Many literature assess Bhutan ended her as isolation in 1962. 
1961 with the introduction of plan economy. International media also reported that Bhutan was connected to the outside world with the introduction of television and internet in 1990. Nonetheless, the connotation is divergent. Polarized views clearly illustrating the choices of adjective used to summon Bhutan as landlocked nation. Geographical setting characterizes Bhutan as landlocked without referring to the frame of ties from classical period, which would mean from ancient period to present days. Although there are some uh, some literatures uh, is a main problem for reconstruction of ancient and medieval history to support this statement because many of them are being destroyed by fire, earthquake, flood, and intercinian warfare. However, there are several genres of literature such as historical chronicle, biographical literature, and foreign literature on Bhutan, which can argue that Bhutan was landly country from the classical period, maintaining her ties with the neighborhood from ancient to the present days. Therefore, my study attempts to explore the study, uh, explore and study the historical events on Bhutan to disseminate her existence as landlink nation, not as landlock, looking from the geographical point, not looking from the geographical point of view. The study was carried out using qualitative research, contextualizing to historical method, focusing on secondary sources of information to examine Bhutan as landlink country, not as landlock. So, as we are aware. Most of the literature in Bhutan are based on Buddhist ideology. And there are many genres of literature from Dharma history, religious biography, chronicle, epics, folk songs, poetry, catalogs. So the wide range of those literature gives you the enough uh, evidence to prove that the Bhutan existed. Bhutan existed and Bhutan was never left uh, aloof from the rest of the world, which would meaning there are some literature so-called the Lui Chujun Jamkhoi Montai Tuba, which was lit the in the concise history, concise religious history of Bhutan, which was written in 1759, narrates Bhutan relation with Tibet uh, during 557 AD, even in 815 AD and in 796 AD. This detailed historical literature on Bhutan relation with Tibet by different roller explains how the state has conducted their relation and how they have governed and functioned as a state in the conduct of diplomatic relation with the neighbor. In the event, while examining the trend of Bhutan's relation with the Tibet, the continuity of ties with the Tibetan ruler of Tibet was recorded. So it clearly elucidates that Bhutan was landing country sharing friendship with Tibet. And again, the bi biographical uh, literature are authentic sources of literature containing important and valuable historical information, like biography of Chaka, Gilpo, written by Lutsawa Denman Sema on Sindaraja, gives you the accounts of historical event of 8th century, the coming of Guru Rinpoche Patma Sambhava from Nepal and describing the event between fought between the, the King uh, Chakar Gelpo and the Sindaraja, the Indian King Navudra. And then it, it, uh, it accounts the shared uh, historical information between India and Bhutan, even to the context of Naval. So it is evident that Bhutan did not live in isolation as the courses of event details the ties with India during 8th century, even with Nepal. In addition, the medieval history accounts the coming of a various uh, Kaju Lama from Tibet. So Tibet accounts the Bhutan was never uh, isolated and never been, uh, ne never been left aloof from the rest of the world. And even the visit of first two Portuguese Jesus father, Father Casilla and Cabral in 1627 accounts Bhutan meet to European world. And an interesting, uh, Bhutan had some legitimate power uh, to rule over Kuch Bihar uh, in, in the present day India. And then even the king of Kuch Bihar came as a refuge to Bhutan in 1661 AD as a re result of Mughal invasion in India. So these are some of the historical evidence to claim that Bhutan was not isolated. And during the time of the Theocracy rule, the, the Theocracy gov government, there was a leader called Minjur Tempa. So he actively cultivated a close link with the kingdom in Kathmandu and Jumla. In the, in the biography of the temporal leader, Damchapekar, he asserts that he met uh, Pratap Pala, the king of Yambu, Kantipur, probably, and had been established a temple. So according to the Buddhist sources in 1681, so Pran Narin daughter visited Bhutan to attend even our fourth, uh, the temporal leader's uh, coronation, which exhibits exchange of diplomatic relations in, in South. So all these historical events provide information that Bhutan involvement in politics, diplomatic ties with the Kuch Bihar, and relation with the Kingdom of Kathmandu to, to maintain the balance of power with Lhasa. And then one of the notable event, will, uh, notable event of historical information was during the reign of Desi Sherab Wangchu in 1744. So, in, so in 
so during his coronation the news of his installation was spreaded and sent it to his neighboring country and then he received a congratulatory message uh, from the seventh uh, seventh dalai lama and even the emperor of china chief drukpa hero of the tibet kaju even shake kamru hero and kings of ladakh sankar nepal and sikkim like congratulated him on, on in during the during the installation of the, crowning himself as a dc so all those historical evidence information of uh, ranging from the ancient to medieval the, these are these are enough evidence to prove to the to the western world that bhutan was never landlocked and bhutan never followed the policy of self imposed isolation it is therefore thus evident to conclude that bhutan was landlocked state since classical age and the connotation of bhutan as landlocked is purely divergent view based on geographical mindset and due to poor knowledge on the history of bhutan to to uh, to someone it as a uh, landlocked country thank you this end of my presentation thank you thank you lokzang uh, for finishing much before time and then doing a yeoman service to all your uh, co panelists uh, you know by finishing much before time uh, the argument of your paper is quite evident from the title and i will not explain it further rather i will give it uh, you know to come back after the presentations are made uh, the next uh, presenter is uh, a good friend of mine uh, Dr. Atulashri Kumara Samarakon, who is a senior lecturer at the Open University of Sri Lanka, and he will be talking on uh, a very uh, important and a very dynamic subject uh, that is uh, the question of Sino Sri Lankan relations, the past, present, and future. Uh, Atula, uh, I will give you only eight minutes, so I will, uh, you know, I will not many, make any concession for our friendship. So please finish within five, eight minutes. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairperson. Uh, my topic is Sino Sri Lanka relations, past, present, and future. And I have derived these uh, ideas from my PhD uh, submission, which I made some years ago to Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, China was not politically and diplomatically welcomed in Ceylon until uh, 1956, but it made its impact. Felt from 1958 onwards, as it rescued Sri Lanka from riots over food rice, uh, food and an economic slump due to the fall of export earnings during that time. China's long-term trade relations with Ceylon were cemented during this period, and diversified trade relations were gradually emerging. Uh, after 1956, Sri Lanka's relations with China enabled it to be a closer ally uh, in the spheres of politics, diplomacy, trade, aid, and financial relations, despite the fact that regional India had developed a rivalry with China, particularly after Sino-Indian crisis in 1962. While China's assistance was very often sought by SLFP regimes, or uh, Sri Lanka Freedom Party regime, which also maintained non-alignment uh, following India. The United National Party tended to view China mostly as a trading partner. So there was a difference between the regimes when it comes to relations with China. But after 1977, with an open economy, Sri Lanka attempted to strengthen relations with China, particularly in terms of military cooperation, since India was playing an aggressive role vis-a-vis -vis Sri Lanka in the context of growing ethnic uh, conflict in the country. Uh, India's small neighbors, uh, I caught, view good ties with China as a way to serve as a counterweight to Indian dominance in the region. Uh, court ends. An Indian analyst uh, points out that I caught, in the late 1960s, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi asked all major powers to withdraw from the Indian Ocean and make it out of concern for great power rivalry. Uh, court ends. Uh, politically and diplomatically, Sri Lanka was for one China policy, and it maintained that policy under all governments. It is also assumed that Sri Lanka's engagement with China was part of its regional strategy for assuring a close ally in case India was going to add pressure on the smallest state. In this section, uh, so during uh, 56 to 77, Sri Lanka uh, in China developed diplomatic and uh, trade relations uh, vehemently, and after 83, uh, Sri Lanka wanted to develop military ties with China. China has been an unwavering source of assistance to Sri Lanka after 1952. Both the uh, UNP and the SLFP approached China for trade, aid, and loans, uh, and it was ready to grant uh, uh, such assistance to the small state without conditions, so attached to them. 
or at least the general perception of Sri Lankan diplomatic community toward China was such. The foundation of China-Sri Lanka society marked a special occasion for the relations of the two countries in 1980s. According to Ranil Vikram Singh, then one of the ministers in the cabinet, politically the two countries used to consult each other on global issues. Devel uh, these developments of people-to-people -people contacts uh, and mark, uh, remarks by major politicians of Sri Lanka over Sri, uh, Sri Lanka's relations with China indicate the growing importance of Sri Lanka the importance that Sri Lanka had given to China in its external relations. The 1980s was an uh, era Sri Lanka expected China to play a leading role in safeguarding its territorial integrity and sovereignty. For critics within courts, Colombo has always factored in diversified external relations to withstand pressure from India and uh, the courts ends. And 1980s testified to this reality of Sri Lanka's external policy particularly towards China. So India's indifference to rising ethnic violence and tacit assistance to Tamil militants made Sri Lanka to go to uh, the Asian giant China. The UNP regimes, though ideologically anti-communist, had a huge trust on Chinese uh, uh, states since 1952 onwards. However, uh, much of the West would object to Sri Lanka-China connection. Sri, Sri Lanka used to justify relations with China, mostly alluding to India's favoritism to Tamil's militancy uh, and uh, open high-level uh, diplomacy with China in the 80s. Uh, now I will uh, stray, uh, straight away go to the relations uh, uh, in the current period. In the current period, the, the nature of relations is much more economic uh, trade and trade, economic and infrastructure development. Uh, after 90s, uh, uh, though China did not commit uh, to provide the military aid to Sri Lanka, it was uh, always assuring Sri Lanka that it will be there to uh, safeguard Sri Lanka's territorial integrity and sovereignty in case of uh, if uh, uh, external powers intervene in Sri Lanka's issue. Uh, but after 2009, during the, the post-war period, Chinese uh, uh, cooperation was uh, very much uh, sought by Sri Lanka to counter war, uh, war crime allegations in international arena and also to uh, get uh, China to develop Sri Lanka's uh, infrastructure, basically the infrastructure uh, facilities in ports, uh, in uh, airports, and uh, in many other places were developed uh, with the assistance of China. And Chinese uh, heavily uh, have uh, uh, infiltrated into the development uh, policy of Sri Lanka, as well as uh, now under the present government, China also uh, uh, China is expected to invest in education policy. Culturally, uh, many Confucius centers have been uh, open in Sri Lanka, and China develops a lot of soft power relations. Its soft power is basically impacting heavily on uh, Sri Lanka's education policy, Sri Lanka's cultural relations with China, etc. And Chinese uh, political and diplomatic assurance uh, in the international realm, uh, together with Russia, was uh, something which Sri Lanka used to counter India's and US's pressure, uh, basically in the realm of uh, human rights violation, etc. So in the current context, uh, uh, researchers fear that Chinese uh, policy uh, which was so far uh, non-interference in domestic policy will change uh, at some place and uh, cause to even... 19, 1991, uh, with its Lucist policy, which was declared under the government of P.V. Narshim Harao. So uh, under the Lucas policy, policy, India's focus was to engage economically with the ASEAN countries and it was focusing upon the FTA like, and the trade and development of trade relations with ASEAN countries. So uh, in the first decade, India had some achievement, like India uh, like, uh, was declared as ASEAN summit partner in 2002. And then India also participated in the East Asian summit in 2005. So there were two offshoots that India was following under the Lucas policy. So one of them was the BIMSTEC or the Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation. And the other one was the MDC or the Mekonganga Cooperation. So India has been trying to, under the MGC, India's added focus has been to counter the growing like Chinese influence in the region. So under MGC, India was focusing upon the development of India's cultural relations with the five Mekong riparian nations of Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. 
so an and in bimstick uh, bimstick kind of acted as a bridge between asean and sark because bimstick was everything without pakistan like bimstick had all the countries of sark except pakistan so uh, india's geopolitical we see that uh, like after a point of time uh, during the second phase of focused policy india has been starting a shift from its from focusing upon economics to focusing upon the geopolitics and the geo strategic mode so in 2014 we see that the locust policy was revamped and the axis policy was introduced under the government of narendra modi and the focus was upon the three c's which are culture connectivity and commerce and india since then has been focusing on connectivity with asean and uh, physical connectivity was the focus uh, the areas of physical connectivity were power grid connectivity the completion of the indo myanmar friendship role the kaladan multimodal transit transport project then the mekong india economic corridor and also the railway spur line between kanchipuri and the way so basically the main focus of india was to have control over the sitway route of myanmar through which it could have access to the other asia asean countries so thereby india was focusing on establishment of relations with its extended neighborhood rather than constraining itself to south asia now coming to why myanmar was the crucial link myanmar was the crucial link because definitely as i said earlier that myanmar is a country with which india shares border or physical connectivity and apart from that if india is focusing on connectivity with myanmar then india is also focusing on the development of northeastern region so of india which is underdeveloped and where development has not been taken place and uh, separatist movements are also cropping up in those region so basically if india is focusing on uh, development of relations with myanmar then the northeast region will also be developed and also another thing again in case of uh, myanmar is that like both the chinese and indian interests it intersects in myanmar so india is focusing on cross border trade with myanmar right now so there are four trade points that india is focusing on these trade points are number one is the ayang to somara point in nagaland number two is the zokhathar re point in mizoram the third one is the more tamu point in manipur and the fourth one is the napong pangsu point in the arunachal pradesh however among these four points of cross border trade only two points are functioning right now and zokhathar re is one of the points so india signed the with in in terms of zokhathar re india signed a mou with uh, myanmar in 1994 on trade and economic cooperation however despite that it started functionalizing only in 2004 and if one goes to the zoka the re point right now then they will see that there is any lack of like there is a lack of any commercial center town which is in proximity to either side of the international border then in terms of commercial transactions to the like imagery is a kind of a broader heart like heart means a market so where there is minimal or irregular trading so we see that uh, as against this if we see uh, about myanmar trade with china we see that 83% of myanmar trade is, is is with china and despite uh, like uh, sharing 1700 kilometers of border india is uh, myanmar's 11th trading partner so we see that the connectivity scenario in myanmar's part is worse and there is like uh, a necessity of both interconnectivity and intra connectivity projects to be taken up and uh, thereby there is a necessity of reciprocal and coordinated development initiatives between the two governments uh, and this can be possible only with local participation so yeah so thereby myanmar right now can be said to be in a maneuvering position where like both the countries are dependent on it and apart from that the chinese uh, also have interests in the malacca strait and the chinese also seek to control the way of bengal Uh, through which like it can have a control in the to, to the malacca strait through which all of its trades happen in case of india india is having the andaman and nicobar islands and from it it can have you know oversee the malacca strait so india is also there is a geopolitical and a geo strategic uh, like kind of reasoning that is coming up and myanmar both because of its geopolitical position and both because of it being a asean country is of vital importance to india Didi, you have one minute less than yes, one yes sir yes sir so yeah so like uh, so that is my concluding point so that uh, india needs to uh, focus on development of uh, local stakeholders in the region and needs to you know back up its interconnectivity and intra connectivity projects with myanmar if it wants to remain like into the game thank you thank you really thank you thank you for uh, you know uh, finishing your presentation in time um and uh, uh, 
you know, uh, the presentation on is, is on a very important neighboring country. And I will come back uh, on that uh, during the, you know, uh, during the discussion session. Uh, next, uh, we have the next presentation from Toki Niamgyal Bhutia, who was a student at the Jawaharlal Nehru University of New Delhi. And uh, she will uh, be uh, presenting again on a very important topic uh, that needs to be discussed much more in a pragmatic fashion, you know, um, rather than the umbrella debate about Bhutan being India's nicest and closest friend. So we need to go a little more than that. And I think, uh, you know, she'll help us do that uh, and uh, carry forward the discussion. So she will be presenting on Bhutan's increasing, uh, Bhutan's increasing importance for India's foreign policy. Uh, Choki, please go ahead. The floor is yours. You have eight minutes. I think Choki's audio is not visible. I mean, see, her uh, audio is not working. Only her video is working. Uh, could we move to the next presentation and we can come back later? Yes. Okay, okay, we'll do that. Uh, so um, uh, I think now it's a, a good way to yeah. carry over from what Ridi had presented. Uh, and the next presentation again is uh, on Myanmar, uh, but a very different uh, topic and subject. Uh, Paras Ratna, Paras, you are there? Yes. Yeah, I am there. Uh, so okay. Uh, I need to share my uh, screen. Just a minute. Sir. So will you be sharing or do I share it for you? Oh, I say I will share it. Thank you. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes, Paras, we can see it. Uh, so Paras is a research associate at the Rastram School of Public Leadership in India. And he will be presenting on democratization and ethnic conflict in Myanmar. Uh, Paras, you have eight minutes. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, sir. First of all, I'd like to extend my uh, greetings to Sri Pramod Jaiswalji and NICE team and to a uh, wonderful chair, uh, Dr. Manish Toranga. So uh, I would going to present, I'm going to present on contextualizing Rakhine conflict, which has made several headlines, uh, both national and international media and has successfully shifted the spotlight away from the Myanmar's democratic transition process. So when I talk about contextualizing Rakhine conflict, I explore it through three factors, which I say is uh, responsible for uh, such violence. One is democratization, second is history, and third is race. In my presentation, I will successively deal with all these three factors and so how these contribute to the uh, conflict, ongoing Rakhine conflict. Uh, so, first of all, we are all familiar with the overview uh, of the conflict at how Rohingya or Arakan Salvation Army attacked the police force and that prompted the disproportionate reaction by the Myanmar. An important point to note here is that, or appreciate here, is that Bangladesh has absorbed substantial Rakhine refugees as of now. Uh, it has almost 9,54,282 refugees. So, while we, in our domestic discourse, keep talking about influx of Bangladesh refugees, it is also important to note that Bangladesh this itself is host of a, a large number of refugees from its neighboring country, that's in Myanmar. Uh, let's talk about paradox of democratization. Democratic transitions are often violent in many states. Uh, one reason for such is uh, because when the state is in a demo process of democratic transition, it has ineffective institution, uh, mostly uh, if it is an ethnic diverse state, if it has excessive centralization of state apparatus in the hands of one ethnic uh, group, as we see in Myanmar, excessive centralization in the hands of Bamber, then it incentivizes the use of political violence. Another uh, factor that is responsible is uh, Myanmar as a polity is quasi-democracy. That is, military holds major portfolio and a quarter of seats in, par par in, in the parliament. In fact, all successful democracies Crises, be it UK, France, Norway, etc., are all product of political violence. So this uh, violence that we see is is, is nothing in, in unusual if we combine, if we look it in in the long run and compare it with uh, the process of democratic transition that has happened in different countries. However, in the long run, it shows that in a multi-ethnic society like Myanmar, democratic institutions are effective in containing political violence. Uh, 
Another reason is the spread of social media uh, from 0.5 million internet users in 2011 when the transition began to 21 million in 2019 is, is, uh, points to a huge democratization of the internet space. Freedom of expression in ethnically divided society is often leads to outpouring of grievances and sentiments. Uh, so we see UN committees uh, pinpointing uh, the role of Facebook in the spread of hatred and fake narratives. As a result, uh, Facebook was compelled to suspend the accounts of top officials such as Min Aung Hliang and Nevadi TV network of the Mil Myanmar military. Another factor, and that is the more important factor, is the race. Uh, so what type of society is Myanmar? Is it a multi melting pot or is it a salad ball? I argue it is a salad ball because all groups have uh, are attached to their ethnic identity. In fact, ethnic identity is embedded across the Myanmar society. Ethnic identity can be classified in two ways, bomber and non bombers and then tying in that it is indigenous race versus the foreigners who are foreigners, the Kala, for example, uh, uh, the, the Burmese Indians or, or, or the Rakhine Muslims, uh, they are called uh, colloquially called as Kala, whereas the Chinese are called Toyok. So uh, this is the uh, broad overview of the politics of indigeneity, which is crucial to understand the contestations in Myanmar. Tying in that it is the indigenous races, as, uh, as we can translate it, was a crucial component or is a crucial component in nation building vocabulary of Myanmar since the 1960s. General Nevin used it in a great fervor to unite together different races for the uh, betterment of Myanmar, which was battered with the ethnic conflict uh, since, since, since the days of its independence. So Rakhine conflict, I argue, is not about citizenship because all the third generation offspring of the 20th century migrants are extended full political rights according to the 1982 citizenship law. But it is about indigeneity. Who is who constitute tying in tha? Uh, so reluctance lies in acknowledging them not as a citizen of Myanmar, but as Rohingya, which means of Rohan or of Arakan, that is an indigenous race that is tying in tha. So that is how politics of indigeneity is crucial to understand this. So why is uh, acknowledgement of Taing Yintha or, or indigenous race problematic for, uh, uh, is a problematic uh, for um, uh, Myanmar uh, polity? One, because uh, if you, according to Myanmar's constitution, if you acknowledge someone as Taing Yintha or indigenous race, then if their population is contiguous, is, is equal to half of the contiguous township, then they are entitled to an autonomous zone, very much like San or Kachin state. Bestowing Rohingya status to Rakhine Muslims would make them eligible for an autonomous zone. This generates anxiety in the, in the minds of both uh, Bamar Buddhists as well as the minds of the Arakan Buddhists. <laughs> Next come to the, the interplay of race. Arakan Buddhist and uh, also considers both Rakhine Muslim and Bamar Buddhist as outsiders. Uh, so for the Arakan Buddhists who are fighting uh, the Rohingya or the Rakhine Muslims there, both the uh, Myanmar military and, and the uh, Rakhine Muslims are outsiders. For them, uh, their homeland, uh, they find solace in Marakyu kingdom uh, of the days of 15th century. So <clears throat> Contrary to general perception that Tatma Dao or the Myanmar military is acting hand in gloves with the Arakan Buddhists, it is important to highlight that the Arakan rebel Buddhists are also fighting Tatma Dao or the Myanmar military for their confederate status. So for them, both are uh, outsider, be it the Rakhine Muslims or be it the Bamar Buddhists. So this is an important thing that is needs to be highlighted. Uh, next is history, how history saves it. History Paris, is to, yeah. You have less than two minutes. Okay, so historical memories are, are, are an important uh, plays an important role in the uh, in the ongoing con conflict. World War Two, one ethnic group was pitched against the another ethnic group, and that led to retributive communal violence. The memories of which influences today as well. Uh, next, uh, uh, we all need to talk about Rohingya as a his historical identity. There is no historical there is no survey of Rohingya history which says that Rohingya is a uniform ethnic identity. In fact, as Jack Lyder argues that the existence of single identity is difficult to point because Arakan had Muslims from Arab, Deccan and other worlds. So this uniform Rohingya identity is rather a political construct rather than an ethnic construct. How do you manage fault lines? To manage fault lines, Myanmar's leadership need to weave together ethnic armed organizations and provide adequate safeguard for minorities within the ethnic states and robust civil society engagement for uh, fault lines. Next, it should also carry on disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration of ethnic armed groups as a part of federal defense forces, uh, as is the case of Bosnian example. Uh, 
thank you with this i think i would like to conclude it thank you thank you paras uh, for uh, you know taking us through the entire sweep of identity politics in myanmar and i certainly have some questions for you at the end um, but it's a very interesting topic nonetheless um, so uh, thank you and we move on to uh, do we uh, paras can you stop sharing uh, so we do we have uh, toki now uh, her, her audio is good Uh, so i guess he probably has some connectivity issues i had been trying to contact him since uh, last 10 15 minutes but couldn't reach out to him okay then we go with the next presentation and see if she, she comes back okay so uh, do we have uh, may i ask sandar zau yes i'm here sir uh, yeah uh, Mayat uh, is a research intern at the Myanmar Institute of Strategic and International Studies, Myanmar, and uh, she will again be presenting on a very interesting aspect of Myanmar. Now, uh, you know, from uh, Didi talking about Myanmar as a crucial link in India's access policy to Paras talking about the Rakhine State problem in Myanmar, uh, we now go over to Mayat uh, talking about a big picture issue, which is. Uh, navigating the us india china triangular access in uh, sri lanka and myanmar so she has two case studies uh may I, you have uh, eight minutes uh, like everyone and the floor is yours please go ahead thank you sir for the recognition uh, let me first share my powerpoint uh, can you see it i can see it please go ahead Uh, thank you. So, of all the countries in the Indo-Pacific, why Sri Lanka and Myanmar for this presentation? Uh, first of all, because of their geostrategic location, uh, Sri Lanka is at the center of Indian Ocean and and a gateway to the Indian subcontinent, while Myanmar is at the crossroads between India and China, as well as between India and Southeast Asia, and for India's ex-East foreign policy. Secondly, because they both are emerging markets with a huge potential because of their locations, but they also have weak political and economic institutions, which greatly hinder their progress towards diverse economic partnerships. Thirdly, they both have lingering human rights issues, such as the case of Tamil civilians during the civil war in Sri Lanka, and the case of Bengali or Rohingya refugee crisis in Myanmar, and the retreat of the U.S. from these two countries, which leads me to India's role as a pragmatic partner in its engagements with these two countries, but with a lot of constraints, which I'll explain further later on. So I'll start with Sri Lanka. In the recent 5th August 2020 parliamentary election, the former president Mahinda Rajapaksa and his SLPP party won in landslide, which was seen by many as Sri Lanka to be tilting towards China because of the former president seemingly pro China stance during his presidency while he was waging all out approach in a civil war with Tamil Tigers and during the height of the civil war in 2007 the US ended direct military aid and downsized USA staff and projects but, uh, by pointing out allegations of human rights violations and war crimes at the same time China stepped in as the largest foreign investor and arms supplier and provided crucial diplomatic support to Sri Lanka So like all the countries in the Indian Ocean region the Belt and Road Initiative largely shaped the bilateral relations and most prominently the Hambantota Pact which uh, Sri Lanka made a 99 year lease to China as a debt rep for 1.5 billion dollars so with this growing in Chinese influence in Sri Lanka India stepped in as a pragmatic partner such as non interference in the domestic issues and also with economic active economic and military engagement for example in partnership with Japan the Trincomalee integrated urban development project and the nuclear energy pact between India and Sri Lanka in 2015 that all these uh, India's engagements have been constrained by the weak economic cloud infrastructure building capacity and the small trade volumes of India compared to China not only in uh, Sri Lanka but also in Myanmar and other southeast asian states as i mentioned in the powerpoint and secondly the historical mistrust between the two countries uh, because of the role of india's tamil nadu state politicians with tamil tigers and the infamous 1987 operation pomali which greatly strained the bilateral relations at the time and caused the mistrust within the sri lankan community to some extent so with this historical mistrust with india 
along with the US and EU position during the height of the civil war probably made the Sri Lankan government and some Sri Lankan population consider China as a crucial ally and some domestic opposition against the US renegotiation of 1995 status of forces agreement and the Sri Lanka Compact of Millennia and Challenge Corporation and also US and, uh, and also India and Japan initiated Tringomly Integrated Urban Development Project, which I mentioned earlier. So with these facts in Sri Lanka, it is widely seen as China is increasing its leverage in Sri Lanka, which is also the same in Myanmar. Uh, so during the administration of President Wu Deng Se, uh, China's position in Myanmar was quite offensive, I would say, because of Myanmar's rapprochement with international community and its more diverse economic and diplomatic partnerships with the suspension of controversial Myosung Tam project. But the bilateral relations became the two countries be uh, arguably stronger during the NLD government, driven by the three factors at stake. The first is about the economy, China's multi billion dollar loans from the Belt and Road Initiative, and the direct aid to the government are huge incentives for government of Myanmar, as well as other governments of small countries, which are lagging far beyond infrastructure capacity. And the second is about China's huge leverage on Myanmar's ongoing peace process. For example, the remaining non-signatories of nationwide ceasefire agreement and CA, most importantly, the Arakan Army and the Northern Alliance operate on Chinese border. And the third factor is probably the most important, such as China's crucial diplomatic support to Myanmar regarding the Bengali or Rohingya refugee crisis. And just as in Sri Lanka, uh, BRI largely shapes the bilateral relations, such as the China-Myanmar Economic Corridor, CMEC, which is a Y-shaped corridor. And of all the projects of the CMEC, the most crucial Chinese geopolitical initiative was uh, Jiaoqiu Special Economic Zone and the Deep Sea Port in Rakhine State, which could be a great answer to uh, China's uh, Malacca dilemma. So the importance of China-Myanmar Economic Corridor was apparent during President Xi's visit to Myanmar earlier this year in January 2020 with signing 33 agreements about the CMEC. And the visit was quite significant in the diplomatic sense because of Myanmar's reaffirmation of one China policy amidst the ongoing pro-democracy protest in Hong Kong and President Xi's pledge to continue diplomatic support to Myanmar. So with, these, with all these facts of of China's leverage in Myanmar, China is widely seen as a victor, which leads me to the rule of India. Yes, uh, in Sri Lanka, India practiced a pragmatic approach and non-interference non in the refugee crisis and also conducted its own initiatives, such as the, the landmark defense cooperation agreement in July 2019 and uh, conducting joint naval and military exercises and promoting its made in India arms industry and also uh, India probably see, India sees Myanmar as critical for its ambition to become a $5 trillion economy by 2024 as the crossroads of ASEAN India free trade area. And just like in, uh, just like China, the most uh, crucial India's project in Myanmar exists in the Rakhine State, which is the Kaladan Multimodal Transit Transport KMTD initiative. Uh, the project is still in limbo because of the index M clashes between Myanmar M forces Demador and the Aragon army uh, in Rakhine State. But if the project is to be implemented, this could be a great counterbalance against China in Myanmar as well as in the region, in my opinion. So let me conclude. So as for the conclusion, uh, for the US and India to, collab to collaboratively counter Chinese influence, uh, India should uh, embrace more on multilateral institutions such as rejoining regional comprehensive economic partnership and the and in my opinion, the U.S. should employ more constructive means to promote democracy, ethnic, and religious tolerance. Uh, in my opinion, uh, Sri Lanka and Myanmar are quite sovereignty sensitive states because of their history of colonialism by the Western powers and their own acknowledgement of their geostrategic uh, significance. So the U.S. more constructive approach uh, rather than using only the hardline approach could reduce their suspicions of hidden agenda, in my opinion, and in doing so could gradually help the U.S. to match Chinese economic influence with prudent and far-sighted strategy with like-minded partners. And that is why I'd say that the U.S. should apply pressure to both armies to be more accountable, but at the same time should appropriately engage with these two armies to gradually influence the military personnel towards democratic practice in the longer term. 
So that is for the individual practice and for both gantries to have more coordinated and concrete infrastructure initiatives. I say a good example could be to incorporate India into the blue dot network of the US, Japan and Australia, which I think is also incompatible with the quad in defense sector. And I think and doing so could be a great uh, counterbalance against Chinese influence within the region, as well as beneficial to all the gantries in the Indo-Pacific to have more expanded uh, choices in fulfilling their respective national interests. That's it for me. Uh, thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Miat, uh, for finishing well in time and then uh, giving us a snapshot of, uh, you know, Myanmar's <coughs> approach and view of uh, the great power competition that is lurking uh, in the region and beyond. Uh, so, uh, Choki, your um, uh, so uh, thank you all the presenters, and uh, we will wait if Choki comes back, and then she can she can make her presentation. Uh, we still have some time on our hands. Um, so what I will do uh, is that um, you know I will uh, just go by the uh, uh, you know sequence and. Uh, put a um, couple of questions to each of the speakers and then, uh, you know, we can take a round and then uh, let the speakers answer their, answer the particular comments or questions. So, uh, you know, let me start with Atula. Uh, Atula, I, I think you can uh, uh, hear me. Yes, yes, I can. Uh, Atula, so, um, you know, as I said, you made a, uh, you know, great presentation um particularly focusing on the point that uh you know this despite uh, this current sort of a focus on sri lanka as a important node of the indian ocean uh, geopolitics and by dint of that as an important node of the indo-pacific geopolitics and hence uh, sort of like coming as a central part and then you know as a part of the maritime silk road um, being in the news uh, always for uh, issues relating to Hamban Tota port or from an Indian point of view, issues relating to Chinese entry of ships and nuclear submarines in Colombo port and other things. So, uh, and what I can see, I think, is this thing that many scholars have pointed out, which is the policy or let's say the practice or the strategy of hedging of a smaller power between uh, greater powers and then uh, uh, you know leveraging the uh, economic or military sort of benefits that you get from practicing such a thing now my question to you uh, and uh, is uh, you know when we see this um, type of strategy or practice of smaller countries uh, what do you think is the major challenge uh, or what do you think is the point where it becomes difficult for a smaller country to keep hedging uh, and then you know uh, it might become much more uh, difficult for a small country to hedge and then might be forced to take sides so my question is certainly related to the challenges to the issue of hedging and uh, how does uh, you know what is the debate for example in colombo uh, in the strategic community regarding uh, this policy. So that is uh, for Atula. Uh, um, for Monica, um, you know, first of all, I would uh, give a few minutes to Monica uh, to uh, to give her conclusions, which she was not able to do properly. Uh, but uh, my question to Monica would be because she started by presenting something regarding the liberal international order and the debates regarding the challenge to liberal international order and this question about like what is china bringing on the table right uh, what is chinese leadership of or if there is a chinese sense of hegemony which of course uh, the chinese will deny um, if there is such a thing with chinese characteristics you know uh, what would that look like you know how what would be the parameters like if we say there's a u.s hegemony we say for example that there's democracy and there is like multilateral institutions, um, uh, you know, and economic capitalism and all those kind of things. Uh, so what would be the parameters of a Chinese sort of a thing? And then probably you could link it to um, the technological sector that you were talking about 
and setting rules and regulations in the technological sector. So how do you see that approach, uh, you know, of, of China? Uh, the next, uh, to the next presenter, uh, uh, to Dr. Datta, uh, a very interesting presentation. And you made your point very clear of uh, how you locate, uh, let's say, you know, in India, we kept talking about India's strategic autonomy. Uh, but I think you fairly sort of pointed out the importance of locating uh, Bangladesh on strategic autonomy also uh, in terms of how it will navigate its relations with both India and China, why they are both important to, uh, both the countries are sort of important to Bangladesh. Now, um, and you mentioned, I think this is something that I find very interesting and probably you could throw light on this. You mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, India's role in the Bangladesh liberation, you know. Uh, so on the one hand, you have this thing about like what you are talking about, cultural linkages and all those things and India's role in Bangladesh liberation, you know, but over the period, you know, I, and I am portraying the kind of uh, debate which happens in India, for example, that we often see Bangladesh or the relationship with Bangladesh from a two prism thing, you know, which is that if Khaleda Jia comes to power or the BNP comes to power, it's bad for India. If Shaikh Hasina comes to power, it's good for India. Uh, you know, what is the debate in Bangladesh regarding this India's view of its relationship with Bangladesh? And also uh, because, uh, you know, I, because I belong uh, to the Northeastern part of India, I, I, you know, so uh, whenever we discuss, let's say, uh, Northeast insurgency and specifically the small arms trafficking, you know, stretching way up way to Yunnan province in China. And the one name that often comes up is Cox Bazaar in Bangladesh, right? So what is the current situation regarding this as the, Indian government and the Bangladeshi government been able to come to some arrangements to uh, claim down on this or at least contain, you know, the use of these ports and the Chittagong hill tracks and other things uh, by Northeast insurgents and, uh, and other such elements. So those are uh, my questions to you in the first round. Uh, Minakshi, uh, I, I think there is already a question for Minakshi uh, by, uh, by some, uh, uh, you know, some of the participants. Uh, which is that they are, uh, you know, according to some of the participants, they are reflecting on the level of, let's say, the crisis or the level of the kind of debates that we are having about the India-China border conflict, uh, which is, uh, you know, you had a couple of meetings with the defense minister as well as the external affairs minister, uh, you know, with, 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 uh, with Chinese establishment. And there have been diplomatic efforts, for example, to scale down and de-escalate this issue. But nevertheless, this seems to be one of the most, let's say, um, um, serious conflicts to have uh, uh, happened between the two countries. And uh, Doklam was not very far away, right? Into, it happened in 2017. So uh, the question is, uh, you know, uh, what are the challenges to mutual understanding between these two countries? And I think that was also the focus of your presentation. So I think you can throw more light on that. And that is for uh, Minakshi. The, uh, uh, and Riti, for Riti also, I think there's already a question from participants, but I will uh, try to sort of like, uh, you know, uh, my question is, um, you know, you explain about the different projects which are happening with Myanmar at the center point and, you know, the Northeast of India sort of being the gateway and all those things. Uh, what are the major challenges? Because we have been hearing, you know, I am from Manipur, so I know like we have been hearing about the trilateral highway for always, you know, it's been many, many years. And every now and then you have some news that, okay, it's going to be functional this and that. But uh, as far as I know, there are some issues on the Myanmar sector, uh, not the Indian sector or the Thailand sector. So like this, you know, be it the uh, Kaladan project or any such project, you know, it's often compared to Chinese projects in Myanmar. So what are the major challenges that confronts India's projects in Myanmar? Uh, that is one. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that I can see from one of the uh, participants uh, asking you, is that, uh, you know, 
will, uh, you know, uh, what will be the future of, uh, like, you also mentioned in your presentation about SARC and other things. And, um, uh, you know, there are some of these projects that you alluded to, like BIMSTEC, which connects South Asia and Southeast Asia, because you have members from both the regions. So how, I mean, in the backdrop of the challenges, how do you see, for example, like, will BIMSTEC bring new uh, dynamism, for example, to some of these projects? And uh, will BIMSTEC be that antidote that will, uh, let's say, uh, clear some of the challenges that are in front of India? Uh, the, uh, the, the next uh, presentation, uh, okay, uh, Lobzang, if you are there, uh, my uh, question to Lobzang, because he presented on Bhutan as a land link country and not a landlocked country. And that's a very interesting reflection, I think, on the nature of boundaries and borders in South Asia and also connecting to Southeast Asia. And how do we, how can we reimagine, for example, borders and boundaries in this region? And some country that is being seen as landlocked, how do you see them as a connecting link rather than being seen as a landlocked country? My question to you is, what is the Bhutanese perception or what is the debate back in Bhutan regarding the issue of border between China and Bhutan? Because that's very fundamentally important from India's point of view. And we remember Doklam, right? So, but uh, every now and then, for example, uh, we, we, we say, for example, that there is a change or a dynamism being seen in India-Bhutan relations also, and it cannot be, the point is Thimpu cannot be taken for granted. So what is the, what is the, what is the debate in Bhutan regarding the trajectory of Bhutan-China relationship? That's my question to you. Uh, my question to Paras. Uh, Paras, again, a pre a presentation on a very sensitive issue. Um, so Paras, uh, you know, I want to con, uh, argue about your select ball representation a little bit because uh, that is uh, you know a little bit similar to the kind of debate that happens in the diversity that is uh, seen for instance in the united states also you know where the idea of a select ball is that you have all these ethnicities and when they bring when you bring them together they become this select ball but the point about select ball is that you do not you do not lose your identity, right? From a salad, you can still pick out your cucumber, you can still pick out your tomatoes. And that's the point about salad bowl, that you become one and become a salad, but you don't lose your identity of what kind of vegetable you are or what kind of fruit you are. So that's the point about salad bowl. So my point is that if we are having a Rakhine issue or a Rohingya issue in uh, Myanmar, and if there is some sort of a Buddhist majoritarian sort of an approach to Myanmar, is it apt to sort of picturize it as a salad bowl altogether, right? So that's my uh, uh, point of view. The other thing is like, when you look at the Rakhine issue or the Rohingya issue, uh, you know, what comes to my mind is literally this complexity of uh, you know, complexity of continuum of identities and ethnicities that crosses over from South Asia into Southeast Asia. So what you have in Rakhine problem is this complex intermingling of porous borders and a long history of migration from, you know, different, different areas. And, you know, when, you know, when new borders get, get established, right, with Westphalian nation state boundaries where one identity ends and another identity begins. I think that's where the problem comes in, right? So how do you see uh, modern state boundaries as a uh, factor, for example, in problems like the one that you see in Rakhine? Uh, last but not the least uh, to my questions to Mayad and uh, uh, the Okay, there is a question to Paras from uh, the, I, I missed that question. Someone is asking Paras that, uh, what are the similarities or differences between the Rohingya issue and the Israel-Palestinian issue? Uh, 
Uh, I don't know if uh, you know that, uh, like, so that is for Paras if he wants to answer that question. Uh, the other question or the last question for Mayat is, uh, you know, when you uh, talk about Myanmar's approach to great power politics, right? So how do you see, for example, the role of the NLD and the coming of democratization, you know, whatever the, like level of democratization it is, the, 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 the kind of Western approach that you are, going, you are seeing towards Aung San Suu Kyi, for example, right? So how do you, how do you, you know, how do you see, for example, that in 2011 or 2010, you had Hillary Clinton, 2011, you had Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State of Obama administration visiting Myanmar. And that happened after 1955, when John Foster Dulles came during Eisenhower's time, a big gap, right? But when Hillary came, there was this big hue and cry about, you know, this US changing approach to Myanmar and all those things. But down the line with the Rakhine issue and other things, uh, you have a shift in that, whereby there are more problems now in West, uh, Myanmar's relationship with West. So how do you see this shift, you know, in how Myanmar is going to navigate, uh, you know, its relationship with the West in order to create leverage for itself in its relationship with a country like, uh, with a country like China? Second question is because you took Sri Lanka and Myanmar. My question is, uh, they may be similar in terms of being small countries trying to navigate great power politics. But their geography is a little different, right? You know, Myanmar is uh, much more of a uh, player in the continental Asia or the continental Indo-Pacific part of it. While in Sri Lanka, you have a player which is right in the heart of the maritime Indo-Pacific part of it, right? So why did you take these two case studies and what is the differences and the similarities in these two case studies? So uh, those are my uh, questions to the presenters and we can go as far the sequence so we can have Atula uh, responding to my question first. Yeah, Monish, uh, uh, Monish thank you very much for your kind comments. Uh, and uh, let me, I mean, try to uh, focus on your question, whether Sri Lanka followed and followed a policy of hedging or balancing or the last, something like that. I think uh, we should understand Sri Lanka as a secondary power or a small state uh, lacks much uh, capabilities when it comes to uh, security or military balancing vis-a-vis -vis great powers uh, in the region. So, uh, but historically looking at uh, Sri Lanka, you know, Sri Lanka relations, I think Sri Lanka has followed a certain uh, policy, um, uh, policy of economic hedging, I would say vis-a-vis major powers like uh, major powers of the West and uh, India, because Sri Lanka relied much on uh, China uh, while it faced, uh, uh, while it did not face much security threats, but the economic uh, pressure was much uh, from the US uh, during the period from 56 up to 83. So that was a clear period where Sri Lanka heavily relied with the Chinese uh, economic cooperation and, uh, and uh, it relied uh, basically on the uh, leftist uh, camp. Uh, USSR, China were figuring much on Sri Lanka's foreign policy in terms of economic relations. And after 2009, again, when Sri Lanka's economy was challenged, uh, with uh, human rights politics of the West, uh, uh, both West and the US, and uh, India was uh, quite neutral and not taking side with China, Sri Lanka. So uh, again, there was economic hedging with uh, China and Sri Lanka uh, developed a lot of uh, economic uh, relations. Basically, Sri Lanka borrowed uh, heavily from China. Uh, right currently, Sri Lanka's uh, loans. Uh, 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 total loan uh, 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 loans uh, amounts to uh, like 12 percent or six, say maybe I mean uh, around 10 percent of total loans are from China. I think so. There are uh, I don't have the particular statistics right now, but there are studies done on uh, the Chinese loans, uh, grants, and aids. And uh, ultimately, what happens? Sri Lanka right now have. Uh, 
uh, leased much of the uh, uh, strategic assets to China because Sri Lanka sort of wanted to play with its strategic assets uh, uh, against uh, threatening powers, uh, basically India and the US. Uh, ultimately, the reality has been that uh, Sri Lanka itself has lost some of the strategic assets like Hambantota Harbor, and that is on a lease agreement. But this hedging policy, economic hedging, I would say has been beneficial uh, at, at times when Sri Lanka was facing security threats and its economic uh, security was not that much uh, supported by the West because there was, uh, uh, there was a cut in GSP plus uh, 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 benefit and Sri, Lanka's, uh, uh, Sri Lanka lost most of the economic uh, export uh, income from the West due to the human rights violation uh, in the domestic ground. So vis-a-vis, -vis, but uh, the West and the US, I think uh, Sri Lanka has followed an economic hedging policy uh, and uh, made a lot of uh, economic cooperation with China. So today China has consolidated its relations with Sri Lanka and under whatever the government, maybe uh, the, uh, despite their ideological uh, uh, Leaning, but they have to deal with China uh, because China uh, is heavily has heavily invested, and also it heavily backed Sri Lanka uh, unconditionally in the international realm. And today, Sri Lanka has accepted China as one of the major powers, uh, which is uh, which it should focus uh, in its foreign policy largely. So, thank you, thank you, Atula, um, for shedding light on all. Uh, those uh, issues. Uh, can we have Monica? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead, Monica. So, should I get to your question first, or there's a question over here that I see from Nandi? Yeah, I mean, you can answer the question, and then along with that, you can uh, okay. address your conclusion. Okay. Um, sir, you asked about the nature of uh, China and if China comes to, uh, comes to a global power, what would that ecosystem be? So uh, from my understanding, Beijing's vision for the global governance system or a, a China-centric world order would look like a system which is completely different from the prevailing liberal democratic setup despite its own, the, the hegemony of the left uh, and hegemony of the West and the hypocrisy of the West in, uh, and the dis discriminatory practices that we have seen in WTO, uh, that which uh, India has aired and China has also opposed. And despite all these, uh, uh, the liberal democratic order has given a paved way to individual rights and liberty, which might come to a stall. And it is difficult to map the China's uh, true intentions on digitalization and uh, despite the white papers or Politburo releases and the Xi Jinping's international speeches, we are unable to, uh, there is a lot of ambiguity and there is, uh, we are unable to decipher as to what exactly is this community of shared future for mankind that they're uh, propagating. Uh, is this the global governance that they, uh, they are propagating in, um, in repressive regimes like in Zimbabwe and uh, other failed nations? Uh, even I have this question, is Beijing's ultimate vision for the world, uh, is it an autocratic uh, governance model or, is, or the principle basically authoritarian in nature? So uh, I am, I'm, I'm not the right person to answer your question, but uh, there is a lot of ambiguity from their part and we need more clear cut answers. And there is yeah. a question as to uh, uh, regarding how we can rely on uh, Chinese tech, uh, tech and uh, well, on the ground, uh, most Chinese private enterprises uh, look look like private entity, but they are uh, partially state-owned enterprises or being backed and subsidized and pushed uh, even in the uh, stock uh, listings by the state. So there is a, a private state uh, nexus, which is uh, still uh, incomprehensible and which is not clear. In the case of ZT in Huawei, uh, party state uh, co-option in the form of government funding and preferential procurements have been particularly evident. Uh, it, it is hard uh, and it is impossible to track the web of parties involved and uh, the influential uh, 
personalities or party members and the uh, involved in the state owned enterprise and the involvement of state owned enterprises in private entities as well so when there is a link of uh, cap capital funds and the in i mean even the innovation startups how much are they um, are they away from the party or uh, the uh, the military and the party and the provincial governments it, it all depends uh, on uh, delineates to this line how free are the private uh, entity thank you thank you thank you dr datta thank you sir uh, for your nice questions actually in my questions um, uh, for the first i just have two part in my questions first is the historical uh, relations history of the political parties with uh, india so uh, in the historical background uh, we can see the one 15 august 1975 a few army officers has killed the father of the nations bangabandhu sheikh mujibur rahman who is the founder of the bangladesh awami league china didn't uh, formally establish bilateral ties with bangladesh only until 1975 four years after the birth of bangladesh but the bilateral relationship in the immediate post independence period was placed by the league of china's role in the liberation war where it sided with pakistan and it against in bangladesh the strained relationship was further highlighted by the use of the veto by china in the security council to block bangladesh entry into the united nations in 1972 since china recognized bangladesh in october 1975 the countries have persistently promoted a deepened uh, their political economic and diplomatic relation uh, with china uh, and the, my another question is the insurgent of northeast india actually uh, northeast india is the most uh, unstable and insurgency affected place in the war in the country after the kashmir it is the East uh, most parts of India, the region is composed of the eight states, namely Meghalaya, Manipur, Assam, Mizoram, Tripura, etc. And the uh, India's northeast connects with the five countries, especially Bhutan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, China, and Nepal. If we recall the Tantrak arms case in Bangladesh, the incident of Tantrak arms took place in Chittagong, Bangladesh, on night of first April in 2014. when police and the coast guard interrupted the loading of tent trucks and seized extensive illegal arms and ammunition at the jetty of chitagang urea fertilizer limited on the karnapuri river this is believed to the largest amount smuggling incident in the history of bangladesh and investigators believe that that delivery was intended to the united liberation front of assam ulfa a militant group seeking the independence of assam from india and considered responsibility for the causing thousands of deaths since 1979 its military wing chief forest borowa then living in dhaka was among the 50 person unlimited charge of the case on the other side the incident occurred during the administrator of bangladesh nationalist party bnp and its four party alliance which led the government from 2001 to 2006 Media analysts said that, given the scale of the operations and existing problems with the corruption, high government officials and intelligence officers were believed to be involved in the smuggling crimes. So it is clear that Bangladesh Awami League party is very close to uh, India, and Bangladesh Nationalist Party (BNP) is uh, known to as a pro-China party, which is against Indian sentiment. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. uh next we have uh, minakshi please go ahead um thank you sir uh you asked me regarding regarding the reasons for the clashes between china and india well if i talk about the reason then the main reason uh, the first main reason is different interest like both nation have different interests like china want to increase its uh, vision like as china wants to like control the whole south asia like as he is trying to become friendly with pakistan he is trying to become friendly with nepal bhutan and now with bangladesh also with sri lanka also but on the other hand it, india is not like this like india is a more peaceful kind of nation like india is trying to develop the relation but on friendly basis not on authoritative basis the second reason the second possible reason is like both nation has different kind of government like in india as we have democracy but whereas in china this is not the case and the third possible reason can be the like the present covid pandemic covid 19 as uh, every nation is trying to accuse china for the for being the 
originator of uh, this uh, coronavirus so like uh, so now at present china is trying to like uh, shift the attention of everyone from corona to border dispute with india so this three can be the possible reason for the clashes between india and china and in the chat box uh, somebody asked about the second indo china war like uh, yeah you can term this but it is no correct like you know, as india china hasn't declared any kind of war as we have declared in the in our 90s law so we haven't declared any war so we can't uh, name it as war formally that that's all thank you so much sir thank you minakshi uh lobzang uh thank you chair for your question so uh if i answer your question from a uh, three uh, fr- involving india and china and bhutan so in south asia especially the, in the decision making process is often vulnerable while maintaining foreign policy especially dealing with the neighboring giant like india and china so bhutan is no exception she has always faced difficult tasks of managing ties with two big neighbor and uh, in the context in the context the relationship between Ch- india and china also directly impact the dynamic of bhutan's relationship with one another and at present sino india bhutan have experiences wide swing over the past decade and since the 60s the cementing ties of indo bhutan are moving in the right direction and there is improved cooperation especially in the financing in the budget outlay of five year plan increasing trend Uh, of investment in hydro sector meanwhile there are also other three uh, territorial area of dispute between china and bhutan like jakalung and pasunum and doglam plateau so the two giant are most powerful actor now in the region influencing developmental of cooperation and partnership so meanwhile the long st- standing unsolved uh, border issues between sino india bhutan is critical for the foundation of the relation and uh, and it is very interesting to note that it is very interesting to note that india india is important variables in maintaining in maintaining relationship with china so historically historically now india and bhutan share cementing a relation and the, and the foundation of relation is too strong and with the rise of two joint giant in 21st century is likely to shift her geopolitical alignment in the region so sino india's paradoxical nature of of the ties will twist sino bhutan ties in the south asian spectrum and china and india will also try to enhance their presence in bhutan due to her strategic location as a result the military strength of the china and india will create new tension in bhutan in the doglam we have seen recently as a disputed border territory because of in in, in instability that is produced as a threat although technically sino bhutan border territory dispute and sino india border issues are not related to the status quo but they are politically related we have to understand this the only hope for bhutan is to wait to await the improvement in indo and china relationship in the region by pursuing the policy of balancing act and bhutan will face new challenges with china and india's diplomatic threat while maintaining her presence in the region so given those constraints bhutan will have to keep a low profile in the international arena and must avoid taking part in south asian political game whereby sino india and bhutan may also need to consider trilateral cooperation in the area of non traditional security so sino india and bhutan need to uh, begin effective trilateral with a m- mutual effort to support each country's core strategic vision and can lead to the normalization process in the region so three countries can pursue trilateralism ranging from high level or uh, dialogue strategic dialogue i would mean to resolve the border dispute and improving the relation among china india and bhutan provides opportunity to move bilateral to trilateral to the new insight however the fragmentism among the among the leader is in this three country raises a question of doable or not in the region so to conclude sino in sino when we talk about sino and uh, sino bhutan uh, border issues or relation so we need to include india uh, india india in india in the equation so that india plays a very important role in determining the foreign policy in determining determining the dispute to resolve the border dispute between two countries so bhutan have no hope until to wait wait, to, wait for india to resolve their border issues with china then only we can hope for improvement the only way 
forward for Bhutan and India is uh, by, by adopting the approach of trilateralism. So adopting the way of trilateralism will give a new insight for three countries to move forward. Uh, the, this is the end of my answer. Yeah. Thank you, Lokjang. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you, Lokjang. Thank you very much. Uh, we move to Paris now. Paris, please go ahead quickly. Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah. So your first question uh, regarding uh, salad bowl and Buddhist majoritarianism, I would like to add, sir, that uh, there is a layered reality in this case. For example, if you look at the Rakhine state per se, uh, uh, there is a uh, you can argue that it's between Buddhist, Buddhist versus the Rakhine Muslims, but but there are three uh, ongoing conflicts here, three ongoing contestations rather than conflict. I would say one is between the Arakanese Buddhist, other is Bamar Buddhist, and third is between the Rakhine Muslims. So 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 to say that it's a it's a uniform uh, Buddhist majority is, 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 is I don't think uh, would aptly uh, describe the uh, picture here because I think in Burma race sorry in Myanmar race uh, uh, matters more uh, and sometimes prevail over religion so that's why you say you see Arakan army fighting the Tatmadaw similarly you have uh, you have Moon which are again a core religionist but they have their own own, own contestations with the with the Tatmadaw so. Uh, so what I meant uh, through through salad bowl uh, comparison is that identity uh, there in, in such societies are, are crucial element of it. They're not separated. They, they cannot be a, a melting pot as such. But uh, perhaps uh, if if uh, if the dominant ethnic group which has control of the state apparatus shows willingness to co-opt them through a more federal structure for devolution of power. I guess that's what they are demanding for. Uh, nobody is demanding for a separate uh, nation state per se. People are demanding for confederate status. People are demanding for a federal defense forces uh, because Tatmadaw is believed to be predominantly bomber, uh, 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 bomber force. So they are demanding a, a democratization of defense forces and these things. So I guess if these things are tackled or, or dealt with in a, in, a, in a fairly federal manner, uh, then I guess uh, uh, more or less uh, this <coughs> contestations uh, could be halted. Uh, next is regarding the complexities of migration. Uh, so again, th this is a Pandora box uh, because when we are saying complexities of uh, migration, uh, uh, migration was there uh, since uh, 7th century, 9th century AD when you have uh, in the Rakhine, you have you had Marak, you kingdom, they had in their court employed uh, people from say Arabs, Dekani, but migration was there and, and, and there was a certain amount of fluidity. But what saves this conflict, especially in the current time, is, is one, uh, colonial memory and another, the state building nature, the very state building nature of, of the Myanmar state also saves this uh, this conflict. So if you look at the colonial part of it, uh, when the uh, when in 1824, the first anglo burman war happened, and interestingly, the 1982 citizenship puts 1824 as the cutoff date for who is the uh, who could be claimed to be the indigenous race uh, of Myanmar. So when the 1824 happened, there was substantial amount of uh, substantial influx of uh, uh, um, of, of population from what we, we call East Bengal of British India to to across the Naps River in in the in the in the Arakan province of that time. So that uh, kind of also uh, led to the shift in demography and other. So so. And also during the 1942 Cold War, British for, formed V force, where they employed uh, these uh, Rakhine Muslims uh, as their guerrilla forces, while the Buddhist Iraqans joined the hands with the Japanese. So, so there is there is a profound uh, suspicion uh, that exists. And in 1942 as well, it led to retributive colonial violence where when the British forces withdrew, they started, uh, they, they attacked the, uh, the, the Rakhine Muslims because they doubted their integrity. Next, during the independence movement, when the India was partitioned, uh, uh, two towns is Bothingo and, 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 and my thing, sorry, I, uh, I found, uh, 
I cannot pronounce it that way, but uh, these two townships, uh, which are predominantly Muslim townships, toyed with the idea of, of joining then, then East Bengal, uh, then the East Bengal. Uh, so that memory also saves them. Uh, and that is one of the reasons they are hesitant in giving them, acknowledging them as Rohingya, because they think that if, if, if we acknowledge them for as Rohingya, then they will be entitled to have an autonomous zone, autonomous township, and autonomous zone or autonomous township just at present to Bangladesh <coughs> generates territorial anxiety both in the Arakanese Buddhist and as well as the Bamar Buddhist. So that, that is another thing. Uh, so this is a Pandora box and it has to do with a lot of the state building because in our, if you look at Indian independence struggle, Indian independence struggle, how did we, we go about it? We said unity and diversity. We knew the, the uh, one, a typical uh, uniform uh, template won't fit. So we went saying unity and diversity, uh, where different uh, <coughs> uh, different groups come together and, and and work in tandem with the national unity. So that was missing uh, in in the in the Myanmar's case, where it was predominantly uh, 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 the state apparatus get got consolidated in the hands of, of one ethnic group. So that resulted in there. Next is comparison with the Israel-Palestinian issue. I, I think I don't think th this fits the comparison here because no, Israel. You don't have to answer that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you, Parash. Uh, Thank you. Moving over to the last presenter, Matt, uh, please go ahead and yeah, your response. Am I audible, sir? Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank you for asking me these two questions, which I wanted to address during my presentation, but due to the time constraints, I didn't add them during my presentation. So let me first answer your second question, which is why I chose this topic, uh, Sri Lanka and Myanmar, and their differences and similarities. Uh, to first answer, to first tell you about the similarities. Uh, the first one would be that geostrategic location, which I mentioned in the presentation. So with the Jiaoqiu deep sea port and the project in Rakhine State and the Hamaduta box in Sri Lanka and the Chittagong port in Bangladesh and also uh, Gwada port in Pakistan, this would be like um, China's a string of power strategy against India and also a great uh, arena for the great power politics, and that is why uh, I chose this. And the second reason is uh, the role of British nationalism uh, in these two countries. Like um, the Western critic about the Sinhalese Buddhists in Sri Lanka and the Pama Buddhists in Myanmar are not uh, identical, but there are also similarities, which is the feeling of vulnerability of these uh, two. Uh, Buddhists, uh, the Sinhalese and and the Pamar, uh, and their perceif and their perception on the West uh, double standards or the hypocrisy, and which is uh, which makes that uh, their leader uh, even more popular and leads probably to some disproportionate uh, measures. And the third uh, similarity between them is uh, the uh, massive popularity of the ruling parties, the SLPP in Sri Lanka and the NLD in Myanmar, and also the two leaders. And this is uh, the similarities between the two countries. And as for the differences, uh, I think uh, Sri Lanka is currently uh, more stable than uh, Myanmar because the civil war has already finished. And the country, I, uh, which in my opinion is more, you know, uh, homogeneous. Uh, but while in Myanmar, there are many other ethnic minorities and there's still an ongoing civil war. And the second difference is uh, China's leverage. I think uh, China's leverage on Myanmar is probably uh, more uh, uh, more uh, bigger uh, because uh, not only on the role of uh, diplo uh, China's diplomatic support, uh, such as uh, China's diplomatic support to Myanmar in the, at the United Nations Security Council and and other things, and the role of the economics, but also on its uh, leverage on the Myanmar peace process, which uh, in Sri Lanka has now already finished. And the third uh, difference is uh, the relationship uh, be between China and the West uh, among these two countries, uh, Sri Lanka and Myanmar. I think Sri Lanka has at least some advantage in uh, comparison with Myanmar uh, in its relationship with the West, uh, because uh, 
the West uh, has at least uh, some, uh, you know, uh, massive investment proposals for uh, Sri Lanka, which I didn't see in Myanmar, such as uh, the U.S. Millennium Challenge Corporation's uh, huge economic assistance to Sri Lanka, which I mentioned in uh, the presentation. So this is my answer for your second question, which is about the differences and similarities between Sri Lanka and Myanmar. And to answer your first question, which is the role of uh, State Councillor Duong San Suu Kyi and how the NLD government will navigate its relationship with the West as a leverage against China. So um, as a Myanmar citizen, uh, I think uh, you know, uh, what is different from the perception of the West or the world on the Duong San Suu Kyi is that uh, she's not only a human rights icon as many other people around the world sees, but she's also uh, the, uh, she is also a nationalist and a politician, which she sees herself uh, as well, and which is also apparent in her dealing with the Bengali or Rohingya refugee crisis, in my opinion. So, and for the, how NLD will navigate its relationship with the West, uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, I think uh, the NLD government will focus more on its relationship with Japan, India, and now South Korea, uh, with uh, President Moon Jae-in's New South End policy as a counterbalance against China, uh, rather than it, uh, their engagement with the West, as we see in uh, the election manifesto of the NLD for the upcoming November 2020 general elections. But uh, in my opinion, uh, to, uh, to make Myanmar to be more independent and have more diverse uh, partnerships uh, as a counterbalance against China, uh, I'll use uh, two approaches, uh, which is uh, the liberal approach on the one hand and the realist approach on the other. And on the liberal perspective, I think the NLD government uh, should improve more on the human rights situations, not only in Rakhine State, but also on other dimensions of human rights situations, such as uh, re reform uh, some yes. uh, laws uh, restricting freedom of uh, expression. and. Also in the Rakhine State, uh, apart from the citizenship question, the NLD could also, uh, you know, uh, improve the humanitarian assistance to all the affected communities in the Rakhine State. And this uh, uh, improvement in the human rights situation could be a great leverage uh, to the West. And the second factor is a sound, sec the second factor might sound a realist, which is about the improving uh, Myanmar's economic leverage in the views of the West uh, by taking an example of uh, countries like Vietnam, uh, such as uh, reforming uh, economic institutions and foreign investment laws uh, to attract more foreign investment. Uh, as we see in the U.S. and its uh, and the other Western relationships with countries like uh, in the Gulf, like uh, Saudi Arabia or the Kuwait, the role of economic leverage is also crucial. So, in my opinion, uh, by using both liberal and a realist approach, the NLD uh, could. Uh, improve if uh, Myanmar's relationship with the West as a counterbalance against China. Uh, I hope this answers your question. Thank you, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, last uh, response from Lidhi uh, before we wind up the session. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I'll answer in short. Uh, like uh, the first question was, what are the major challenges that confront the Kaladan multimodal project in Myanmar? So, uh, so there are many challenges that, uh, like, uh, as you said, so that the part of the problem is coming from Myanmar. So it is like absolutely true. So like, uh, reportedly, like there was a vessel that was carrying raw materials for the Kaladan project, but then there were like the insurgency movements in Myanmar that are happening right at the moment. That is causing a kind of trouble for like proper functioning of the Kaladan project. So like, uh, so already India has been into many operations like Operation Sunrise was one of the operations. So right now the political situation in the country of Myanmar and the kind of uh, oppression that the Rohingyas are facing in the country has led to many insurgencies in the country and has affected the functioning of the project effectively. And uh, like that is one of the challenges that confront Myanmar in terms of functioning. The other question was, Will BIMSTEC bring new dynamism to some of the challenges? Uh, I don't exactly know if BIMSTEC will like bring some dynamism in terms of the challenges that India is facing with Myanmar, but definitely BIMSTEC is beneficial for 
India because uh, in Bimstick, in SARC, we see that political, con because of the political conflicts, we cannot have an annual session properly where we can discuss problems. But at least in Bimstick, we have a forum and then like the political situation is stable where countries can talk to one another and even if educational exchanges are happening, even if some mere development is happening, that is beneficial for both the countries, like that is beneficial for all the countries in Bimstick, I think. And about the third question, somebody said in the chat box that why is uh, like uh, India's neighborhood first policy seems to focus mainly on its relations with Stark. Why is it so? Yeah. So basically, India's neighborhood first policy, India, in order to function effectively and in order to promote itself as the hegemon in South Asia, as it claims to be, like in order to promote that, it has to have stable relations with its neighbors first. Definitely, like right now, the situation with neighbor, like the neighborhood first policy is also restricted to only some of its neighbors. We have to understand like these neighbors are Myanmar or Sri Lanka or Nepal. With these countries, India is kind of trying to get into a good relationship or something. But this neighborhood first policy does not apply for Pakistan and China under the current kind of uh, political turmoil that is going on. So basically, while it is saying that it is neighborhood first, in terms of Pakistan and China, the main focus is on stabilizing the relations in the first place so that SARC can function effectively. So, yeah. Thank you, Riri. Thank you, Riri. Um, it, 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 it has really been an illuminating session and uh, the, you know, the, the presentations have ranged across issue areas. And uh, as I said in the beginning, um, all the presentations, uh, when you look at them together, what it, I think, really signifies is uh, you know it's the changes which are happening in the region that we call home you know uh, whether it is South Asia or Southeast Asia you know so so it, it really signifies I think it really brings forth the complexities of these two security complexes which interact with each other and how uh, uh, you know the the politics of these two regions and the role of extra regional players is uh, leading to uh, significant changes in the terms of engagement and the terms of arrangement uh, among the countries uh, you know resident in this uh, in this in these two regions and also leading to significant changes in the toolkit and the playbook of uh, the foreign policies and the diplom uh, and the diploma uh, and the diplomatic core uh, of all these countries both small and big and of different capabilities and aspirations all put together so uh, uh, you know, it, uh, I, I have really uh, gained from this session as I, I hope everyone has, and we stand much more enlightened than we were at 5.45 p.m. when we started this session. So without further ado, uh, I will hand over the floor to Paki. Uh, Paki, uh, you can take the floor and probably uh, give the board of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the end of this session, which was the 10th session, it is my honor to propose a word of thanks on behalf of NICE to all those who have graced us with their presence and contributed their parts to make this event a resounding success. First of all, we would like to express our gratitude and sincere thanks to Dr. Monish Tarangam for uh, agreeing to chair this session today. Our sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing uh, presentations in such a, a short period of time provided to them. We are really honored to have all the speakers with uh, us today. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to all our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Finally, I must mention a deep sense of appreciation for our audience who has participated in the webinar and those who are watching us live on Facebook. Thank you for all your valuable time and attention and for making this session productive with your questions. We are truly obliged to have you all with us on this day, and we hope to stay connected with you in future as well. It's really been a pleasure. Also, do join us tomorrow for the further sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you.